There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood, in the blood, in the blood, in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the saving blood of the Lamb. I was walking down Queen Street recently and heard that old chorus sung probably as badly, familiar from my days 45 years or so ago on the fringes of Pentecostalism. I cringe now at the blood imagery, and it's good to know that there's now a lot less blood in mainline churches, despite the Passover story that we're going to hear in a few weeks from Exodus as that story unfolds, the piece that provides the blood of the lamb image itself around the doorposts. The blood imagery may be uh, seeping into the soil, but the power imagery certainly remains. We continue to use overarching power images in our thinking and our talking about God. With their roots, I suggest, back in ancient sky god mythology. People who are doing exploration around myth and imagery, people like Mishe Eladi, that some of you may know, um, see this powerful sky god as present during the Stone Age, a response to fear in the face of the unknown. God is in the realm of the above, the out there, the away, where everything happens. Then there seems to have been a shift around 8,000 years ago to emphasize rather the life energy of the Earth Mother Goddess ensuring agricultural success as the move from the hunter-gatherer to the agriculturalists takes place. Then subsequently, as the religious traditions that we are part of began to grow and develop, beginning somewhere around 3,000 years ago, I guess, both these sets of images are drawn on and become woven in different ways into the God pictures that we still use today. The roots are very deep. And it seems to me that both the sky god and the earth mother portray power. One of them commanding, controlling, and intervening from a distance. The other energizing life in an engaged and cooperative manager, manner as the early tillers of the soil discovered. And I think we still want a powerful God. We still want someone or something, some energy that might rescue us from the dangers inside us and around us. And often still, we choose the powerful intervening God rather than the close by God, the one who talks with Moses the one who may be experienced as life-giving divine energy in us and around us all the time. God images can, can portray power, I suggest, as either overarching control or as energy within us and around us. Both work. My concern is that the images of controlling power tend to predominate. They're still there in the language we use in the church and receive out of the scriptures. Almighty, Father, Lord, glory as appeared in today's gospel. And these power images remain in part because the systems that shape and preserve our imagery and our social frameworks want to preserve them. They want to preserve them because they are images that protect us from our fears and validate the exercise of power by those systems and by those with leadership within them. We know how that functions. The more you use power language and see a system as powerful and that power derived from God, 
the more you want to keep that in place to keep the power in place. And along with a number of social commentators, I would contend that many of our social and political structures have been predicated on the hierarchical imagery of the powerful sky god and his priests. After all, that's exactly what hierarchy is, of course, the rule of anything by priests of one kind or another. God's power is then given to the structure which becomes God's agent here, and the leaders then exercise that power on behalf of the organization and God. The vicar is, of course, vicariously standing in for Christ. And that imagery is still here when I stand up this high and command from a distance, as it were. We don't usually spell it all out like that these days, but I'm convinced that the underlying images and assumptions do function that way, not just in the church, but in quite a lot of our social organizations, where there is commanding, controlling, intervening power from the safe distance of the top of a tree, the height of a pulpit, and with institutional protection. Our community of faith, the Christian church, has, I'm afraid to say, mostly functioned in this way through its history. Like other ideas, so-called theological truth is largely the set of ideas held by the victors in ideological or ecclesial battles. Those who won the debate insisted that their view was now the only view and it becomes God's truth. Just read a bit about the Council of Nicaea and how its decisions about Jesus' relationship with God were made. Hardly revelation, more the exercise of imperial power. And power in one form or another, and often hand in hand with political maneuvering, has shaped many of our church positions on both belief and ethics. As I look at it, an early triumph was the imagery of the controlling power God over the image of the earth-centered energizing God. Though it is true that the suppressed view has continued in fragments, is still there in our imagery of the Holy Spirit, continued underground in common belief through the church and its practice and is there rediscovered in many ways today through what we term Celtic Christianity. But the Almighty Father God dominated, won the battle at that point, and then combined with a philosophical view that saw the world through a set of rigidly structured ideas, mostly borrowed from some forms of Platonism. And as our result, our Christian communities have tended to function very hierarchically with control over our correct beliefs and our right actions, plus a determination to protect the church at all costs because the church belongs to and represents God here amongst us. I know from my own experience of leadership in the church how hard it then is for a person in such leadership to break ranks, to make a decision that goes against the prevailing so-called consensus or the perception of where the majority lies, or one that others fear might threaten the institution itself. The current bishop's decision not to ordain gay and lesbian people at present in our church is a case in point. Upsetting the anti-gay lobby, it, is, it seems, is judged politically to be a threat to hierarchical power and could divide the church. That side only, interestingly, 